Within the world of sports, there are certain names that transcend these sports and are recognizable to even mostly or completely uninvested outsiders. The most obvious case of this would be for someone like Michael Jordan. Even if you've never watched a minute of basketball in your lifetime, you likely know that he played for the Bulls, or at the very least, that he was a basketball player. While this recognizability is less widespread with many extreme sports, the same principle is essentially true for any sport. When it comes to the sport of rock climbing, a few names you'd be likely to hear from someone with little to no investment in the sport are Alex Honnold, Chris Sharma, and the subject of this video, a man named Dean Potter. Dean Potter was born on April 14, 1972, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Dean's father was an army officer, and like many military families, the Potters would uproot from Kansas and headed north to the state of New Hampshire. Dean was a naturally athletic child, and as he entered into his high school years, he began to take an interest in rock climbing and taught himself how to climb. He was a natural at it and soon began to ascend higher and more challenging routes, solo, and remarkably free soloed a 200 foot cliff wearing Chuck Taylors. For those of you that are unaware, free solo climbing is climbing without the use of any ropes or safety gear at all, leaving no room for mistakes for the climber, as falling often results in grievous bodily injury at best and death at worst. If you'd like to know more about free solo climbing, I'd also suggest you check out my videos I made about John Backer and Marc-Andre Leclerc, as well as this one. Anyways, the teenage Dean was known as a rebellious and free spirit, which was a juxtaposition to his strict military upbringing. After graduating high school in 1990, Dean enrolled at the University of New Hampshire, where the naturally athletic Potter rode for the school's varsity crew team. Dean later recalled the coach of the rowing team's favorite catchphrase, recounting that he would often shout, quote, You don't want to just beat the guy, you want to own him! Dean disliked this catchphrase immensely, and one day after a session of rock climbing, Dean had an epiphany. Dean realized that academia and rowing and owning people was not his cup of tea and dropped out of the University of New Hampshire instead deciding to pursue his passion, rock climbing, as a career full-time. And so, he packed his belongings in a van, which would become his home for the next few years, and headed west, hitting numerous climbing spots on his journey, working a few shifts at local food spots along the way to earn enough cash to sustain his lifestyle. This journey west in the van would last for the rest of the 1990s, as Dean roamed the western United States, honing his skills as he wandered from spot to spot, and by the turn of the new millennia, Dean had refined his climbing to the point that many climbers within the community considered him as one of the top climbers in the sport, and word of his talents soon began to spread outside of the hardcore rock climbing community as he garnered a buzz for his risky but breathtaking free solo ascents including mapping out and laying the groundwork for a free solo ascent of El Capitan, a feat that remarkably would later be completed by Alex Honnold. By 2002, Dean had inked a huge six-figure sponsorship deal with Patagonia and several other sponsor deals with less-known climbing gear companies like Black Diamond. The buzz he garnered from his fearless ascents had begun to skyrocket Dean to stardom, and after he married his wife, Steph, his life seemingly couldn't be going any better. However, at around this time, at what seemed to be the pinnacle of his career, Dean began to have recurring nightmares about falling while free soloing, which he feared would begin to affect his nerve while climbing, an invaluable asset for free solo climbers, and he sought to remedy some of the risk of his ascents without eliminating the risk or freedom that defines the sport of free solo climbing. It was also around this time that Dean began to take another one of his extreme hobbies to the next level, as while still one of the world's top rock climbers, Dean also began to garner renown for his highlining skills as well. Highlining is, much like free solo climbing, an extremely risky and mentally demanding sport where slacklines are extended across large gaps, 
with huge fatal falls lying beneath the line, with some lines looming 3,000 feet above the ground below. Potter, notably, was the first person to highline across Lost Arrow Spire, with no lanyard or any other safety measure other than his reflexes to prevent him from falling from the line to his death below. In 2006, Dean would make Yosemite history when he, along with climbers Ammon McNeely and Ivo Ninov, climbed the Reticent Wall, one of the most difficult routes on El Capitan, in just 34 hours and 57 minutes which broke the previous record for the fastest descent of the route by nearly five whole days. In May of that same year, he headed to his home in Moab, Utah, near Arches National Park, for what would become one of his most notorious and infamous climbing trips of his storied career. He started the trip off with highlining, completing a crossing of two 50-foot lines across three spires, suspended 400 feet above the ground. Dean was so enthralled by this, that over the next three days, he crossed them over a hundred times. After his highlining excursion, Dean then ascended the 900-foot sandstone spire known as the Titan, then base jumped from the top, reaching terminal velocity before he pulled his chute approximately 400 feet from the ground. However, these extreme outings would only be the beginning of his excursion in Arches, as his next stunt would draw attention worldwide. The following morning, on May 7, 2006, before the crack of dawn, Dean and his team headed for the iconic Delicate Arch, the most renowned and visited landmark within the park. Dean intended to make a free solo ascent of the arch, which sits precariously angled, over a steep, several hundred foot cliff face on one side, and a sharply sloped sandstone bowl on the other. Dean and his team tenderly rigged some lines up the arch to practice the route, and after Dean was familiar enough with the route, at the crack of dawn, he made a free solo ascent of the arch. He then completed several more free solo ascents of the arch as the sun rose. These ascents of Delicate Arch prompted widespread outrage from both within and outside of the rock climbing community, as he was blasted for climbing such an iconic arch that so happened to be named Delicate Arch. Dean and his team received an onslaught of criticisms for the climb, including allegations that they had worn into the delicate sandstone with the ropes they had set in order to practice the ascent. In wake of the controversy, Dean was dropped by Patagonia, who notably had promoted the climb to local newspapers before the public backlash, and his sponsor Black Diamond pulled him from their roster as well. In response to all the criticism levied at him, Dean retorted that he had done the climb to raise awareness that ascending iconic landmarks like Delicate Arch was not expressly forbidden, further stating, quote, I didn't see any moral reason not to climb it, which, while the former was true at the time, it was quickly restricted following his ascent. Reflecting on the climb several years later, Dean recounted, quote, The public's response made me feel like I don't know our society's norms anymore, and that I'm a little disconnected. People think that in order for nature to be sacred, you have to separate yourself from it. It was so beautiful, I'd like to go up there and do it again, he said. The controversy hadn't just impacted his climbing career, however, as his wife, who was also a professional climber, also subsequently lost sponsorship deals as well, which caused a rift in the marriage that ultimately led to the couple's divorce later that year. Despite the divorce and his newfound infamy, Dean continued his daring exploits, and over the following few years, he completed numerous difficult ascents in Yosemite, and in the year 2008, he would finally come up with a solution for his recurring nightmares. He coined it freebasing, which has nothing to do with drugs, but rather is a combination of two of Dean's favorite extreme hobbies, free solo climbing and base jumping. He began to wear a parachute when free soloing, an idea he truly put to the test while climbing in the Alps. A true daredevil at heart, Dean was also an avid base jumper, and so, bringing a parachute along, essentially turned what would be a failed free solo attempt 
into a spontaneous base jump, which was a much preferable outcome to the alternative. Throughout the rest of the 2000s and into the 2010s, Dean continued to live his life as he had for most of his adult life, spending his time climbing difficult routes, highlighting, and as the 2010s rolled around, more frequently, base jumping and wingsuiting. In the year 2014, Dean again found himself embroiled in controversy after he released a short 22-minute film titled When Dogs Fly, which revolved around Dean's hearing dog Whisper that would accompany him on many of his daring adventures. Unlike his previous controversy, however, the backlash from When Dogs Fly soon blew over, and Dean was soon back to his favorite high-octane adventures in his favorite place on the planet. Yosemite National Park. On May 16th, 2015, Dean and a 29-year-old man named Graham Hunt headed to Taft Point, which overlooks the Yosemite Valley, for a proximity wingsuit flight from the point to the valley below. The men had completed five previous flights of their planned route and sought to replicate the thrills of the flight they had experienced the first few times. The route was a demanding and technical flight, which required the men to clear a tight notch that cut through a rising, rocky ridge. At just after 7 p.m., with the valley still lit by the late springtime evening sun, the men donned their wingsuits. Dean's wingsuit was bright red in color, and Graham's was yellow and black in color. At approximately 7.35 p.m., the men stood together at the ledge, where Graham unsuccessfully attempted to send his girlfriend a text before he gave up and shifted his focus to the task at hand. Dean was recording the jump on his phone at the time, and the men began their descent. The men zipped down the mountainside as they glided downwards through the air at over 100 miles per hour. However, approximately 20 seconds after they began their descent, disaster would strike as upon approaching the notch through the ridge, Graham failed to properly align himself to fit through it, and collided with the ridge, killing him. Dean was leading the duo and had managed to maneuver through the notch himself, but soon after clearing it, he too came to an abrupt halt as he collided with the rocky terrain as well. Dean's girlfriend, a woman named Jen Rapp, who was acting as their photographer and spotter recalled to investigators hearing a quote, thwap, followed by Gah! sounds. Despite the concerning noises she heard, Jen brushed it off and waited for Dean to send her the usual text he'd send her once he landed safely. However, that text never came, and after waiting at their planned meeting place without seeing any trace of them, her concern continued to mount. As she began to panic, she drove to Dean's nearby home, where she found Graham's girlfriend, who was also growing concerned after not hearing from him since the jump. At approximately 10 p.m. that evening, the women drove to the house of Yosemite's chief of staff, who was a friend of Dean's, who inquired whether the women had called emergency services or reported them missing, which the women informed him they had not, and he urged them to do so which they obliged. A search for the missing men was mounted that same night, but after searching on foot throughout the night, the teams on the ground hadn't turned up anything. However, as light broke, a search helicopter was dispatched to aid in the search from above, and soon located the men's lifeless bodies below. Following the discovery of the men's bodies, an investigation into the deaths was launched. Investigators had their work cut out for them, and upon recovering Dean's phone, which he had been recording his flight on, they had a pretty clear picture of what had happened. Graham had missed the notch and collided with the ridge, and Dean probably did not have sufficient altitude from the ground to go through the gap, as the video he captured cut out when he was a few feet from the ground. Dean's girlfriend told investigators that the men did have a go-around plan if they thought they lacked sufficient altitude, and thus, it was chalked up to a split-second error in judgment. However, as Graham collided with the ridge before Dean did, investigators noted that it was also possible that Dean could have seen Graham hit the ridge, which caused him to flinch. The video taken by Dean of the incident has never been released or leaked to the public. 
Dean's death was felt deeply by the climbing and Yosemite communities, who all mourned his death following his passing. His loved ones, fortunately, were able to find some peace in the fact that Dean, well, was a daredevil who loved the rush of the high stakes of his adventures. When asked in an interview conducted by ESPN, Dean said of his risk-taking ways, quote, I don't have thoughts of an afterlife. I think dying is like when you swat a fly. It's over. I'm addicted to the heightened awareness I get when there's a death consequence. My vision is sharper and I'm more sensitive to sounds, my sense of balance, and the beauty all around me. A lot of my creativity comes from this nearly insane obsession. Something sparkles in my mind, and then nothing else in life matters," he said. Ultimately, Dean Potter lived his life on the edge, on his own terms, something that clearly brought him great joy. Thank you all for watching. 